Hi students, very good evening, very good evening. I hope most you have joined us now. Um, so we are on time. And uh, yeah, weekends there will be classes. Sorry so, to say that. But uh, I, might be, I might be leaving soon. So instead if I don't teach and I leave in between, that will be not good rather than we have a classes, I guess. So we have few students I can I can see who are the regular visitors. So let's start the class at least today. So restriction enzymes first topic so today uh, actually class we will be more concerned about subjective uh, not on the virtual side because these part are also important because we're gonna discuss about DNA based markers a restriction enzyme and then uh, your DNA fingerprinting so all these uh, topics within themselves they are very important uh, from the industrial perspective which are mostly left over because of being complicated to be honest when I was teaching at uh, Martha Gujri College most of the teachers they tend to come to me that uh, sir could you please explain DNA based markers it's very difficult topic to teach it's very complex it's very hard but yeah that's the beauty of uh, taking the hard subject and making it easy uh, that's even make us make me as a satisfied teacher this also make students even satisfied so today we are gonna uh, work upon the mainly subjective part no more videos but at 9 p.m. Um, if you are all join again with me in, in good quantity we will continue with the protein part which is more interesting believe me yeah, at 9 p.m. it will be more interesting so let's start so restriction enzymes that is adufabric uh, sorry yeah so these are the various uh, types of as we know the restriction enzymes mainly are used for the uh, your digestion of your uh, DNA right so to cut your DNA as per requirement using specific restriction enzymes you will get different results having blunt and and uh, uh, sticky ends and then we can use it with the help of cloning to generate our concerned uh, transgenic models. So it has introductions, mode of action, star activity, uh, nomenclature, types of RE, DNA ligase, kinase, reverse transcriptase, phenol fragments and so on. So introduction, so the ability to manipulate DNA in vitro depends entirely on the availability of purified enzymes that can cleave, modify and join the DNA molecule in the specific phase. Yeah. So at present, no chemical method can achieve the ability to manipulate the DNA in vitro in predictable way. Only enzymes are able to carry out the functions of manipulating the DNA and each enzyme has a vital role to play in the process of genetic engineering. The various enzymes used in genetic engineering are as follows. So we use nucleases, restriction enzymes, DNA ligase, kinases, phosphatases, reverse transcriptase, terminal deoxynucleotide transferase and RNAs piece. So we will discuss one by one all these enzymes which are used in genetic engineering and how they are important and, and their respective functions. So first, first thing first nucleases. As the name suggests they are the group of enzymes which cleave or cut the genetic material. Yeah? DNA or RNA. So it has DNAs and RNAs. So nucleases are further classified into two types of base that is uh, which cut DNA they are classified as a DNAs which cut RNA they are classified as a RNAs yeah, DNAs and RNAs and there is further classification based on how they cut actually there are two types of classification so DNAs that act on the ends or terminal region of DNA 
uh, if they cut at the end part of your DNA, that's called exonucleases. And those at the non-specific region in the center, they are called endonucleases. Yeah, exonucleases and endonucleases. Then exonucleases require DNA strands with at least five and three prime ends, and they cannot act on DNA which is circular. So endonucleases uh, can act on circular DNA. Do not require any free DNA ends, right? Whereas exonucleases release nucleotides like nucleic acid, sugar plus phosphate. Whereas endonucleases release short segments of DNA. Then comes your further DNases which act on the specific positions on the DNA. They are called as friction endonucleases. And the sequences which are recognized by the friction endonucleases or friction enzymes are called recognized sequence or friction sites. These sequences are palindromic sequences. So different restriction enzymes present in different bacteria can recognize different or same restriction sites. So interest, interestingly, no two restriction enzymes from a single bacterium will cut at the same restriction site. And how they work, the mode of actions of the restriction enzymes. So the restriction enzymes, they tend to bind to the recognition site first and they check for the methylation, whether there is a methyl group present or not. If there is a methylation in the recognition sequences there, then it is just false of the DNA and it does not cut. If only one strand in the DNA molecule is methylated in the recognition sequence and the other strand is not methylated, then restriction enzymes only type 1 and type 3 will methylate and the other strand at the required position. So the methyl group is taken by the restriction enzyme from as adenosyl methionine by using your modification site in the restriction enzyme. So type 2 restriction enzymes they take place the uh, help of another enzyme called methylase and methylate the DNA and the restriction enzymes clears the DNA. If there is no methylation on both strands of DNA then restriction enzymes cleaves the DNA. It is only by this methylation mechanism that restriction enzymes although present in bacteria does not cleave the bacterial DNA but cleaves a foreign DNA. But there are some restriction enzymes which functions exactly in reverse mode and they cut the DNA if it is methylated. And there is a star activity. Sometimes restriction enzymes recognize the cleaved DNA strand at the recognition site with asymmetrical palindromic sequence. Yeah, they give this asymmetric palindromic sequence. sequence. For example, Bar match one which cuts from the GA always to CC and the extreme conditions in the low ionic strength it can cleave uh, the NGA TCC or GPO TCC and so on and such activity of section enzyme is called as a star activity. The nomenclature of section enzymes uh, how we name them uh, basically to give them uniform name there was a uniform nomenclature was adopted for the restriction enzymes. It was given by Smith and Natans in 1973. So every restriction enzymes would have specific name which would identify it uniquely. The first three letters uh, are in italics indicate the biological source of enzyme and the first letter being initial of the genus and second and third being the first two letters of the species name. So the restriction enzymes from Escherichia are called eco. And Haemophilus influenzae is HIN and Diplococcus pneumonia is DPN and so on. Then comes uh, the letter of strain of a bacteria that which strain does it belong. For example, strain R, then eco R. Then finally, there is a Roman numeral for the particular enzyme if there are more than one in strain in question. That is eco I1, eco I2, eco I3 and so on. So that's how E with the genus, CO with the species, R with the strain and 1 and 2 to, to which kind of enzyme does it belong, the Roman numeral. So that's how the name of the restriction enzymes are given. So basically there are three types of restriction enzymes, type 1, 2 and 3. Type 1 and 3 have an ATP dependent restriction uh, activity and modification activity. Uh, whereas type 1 enzymes they cleave DNA at random site where type 3 cleave at the specific site. On the other hand type 2 Type 2 restriction modification system possess separate enzymes for endonucleases and methyl activities and mostly widely used for the genetic manipulation. 
So type 1 restriction enzymes, these restriction enzymes recognize the rec recognition site but cleave the DNA somewhere between 400 base pairs to 10,000 base pairs or 10 kilo base pair right or left. The cleavage site is not specific and these enzymes are made up of three peptides and multiple functions. So these enzymes require magnesium, ATP and s adenosyl methionine for cleavage or for enzymatic hydrolysis of DNA. And these enzymes are studied for general interest rather than the useful tools for the genetic engineering. Then type 2 restriction enzymes, restriction enzymes of these type recognize restriction sites and cleave the DNA with the recognition site or sequence. So these enzymes require magnesium as a cofactor for cleavage activity and can generate 5 prime phosphate and 3 prime hydroxyl group. Um, they are quite important because of the specificity and type 2 restriction enzymes are further divided into two parts according to the mode of cutting. Uh, so type 2 restriction enzymes that are blend end cutters, type 2 restriction enzymes which are cohesive end cutters. The one with the blend end cutters, they are the one of the class that cut the DNA strands at the same point on both strands of the DNA. Like they give three, three sequence, three uh, nucleotide on the left, three nucleotide on the right. So they give a equal amount of nucleotides on both the ends. Whereas the cohesive ends, uh, they give um, different uh, points at the strands of the DNA within the recognition sequence. So they generate a short single stranded sequence at the end. This short single strand sequence is called sticky or cohesive end. And the type 3 restriction enzymes of this type recognize the recognition site but cut the DNA 1 kilo base pair away from the restriction site. And these enzymes are made up of two peptides or subunits. And these enzymes recognize ATP, magnesium, as adenosyl methionine for action. So this is the summary that we have discussed so far type 1, 2 and 3 from the perspective of structure, composition, cofactors, recognition sites and cleavage site. And types of uh, restriction enzymes based on the cutter, the four base cutters which cut from the four bases. Yeah, uh, they are the six base cutters, these belong to an eight base cutters. Now we have discussed all about cutting, now let's talk about joining. Yeah. We have break the bonds, we have, uh, we have created different uh, restriction enzymes, now it's time to create something unique. So recombinant DNA experiments sometimes requires joining of two different segments and the cohesive ends generated by restriction enzymes will anneal themselves by forming the hydrogen bonds. But this annealing is quite weak and cannot stand the experimental conditions. So to get a stable joining, DNA should be joined by using an enzyme called ligase. So DNA ligase join the DNA molecule covalently by catalyzing the formation of phosphodiester bond between the adjacent nucleotides. So these DNA ligase isolated from E. coli and T4 bacteriophage is widely used and these ligases more or less catalyze a reaction in the same way or differ only in the requirement of cofactor. So T4 ligase which requires ATP as a cofactor and E. coli ligase requires NADP as a cofactor. And the cofactor is first split that is ATP AMP plus phosphate and then AMP binds to the enzyme from the coenzyme AMP complex. Then comes kinases. So kinase is a group of enzymes which adds a free phosphate to wide variety of substrates like proteins, DNA and RNA. It uses ATP as a cofactor and adds phosphate by breaking the ATP into the ADP and pyrophosphate. So they are quite quite famous these soft uh, these kinases uh, in the molecular and genetic engineering for the radiolabeling phosphatases. Then types of phosphatases. So alkaline phosphatases first of all. So these are the group of enzymes which remove a phosphate from variety of substrates like your DNA, RNA, or protein. So phosphatases which act in basic buffer for like pH 8 or pH 9 are called alkaline phosphatases and most commonly are bacterial alkaline phosphatases BAP and calf intestinal alkaline phosphatases CAP, yeah, BAP and CAP and shrimp alkaline phosphatases are also used in the molecular cloning experiments. The phosphatases from substrate is removed by 
forming phosphorated serine intermediates. So alkaline phosphatases metalloenzymes and has zinc ions in them. Then comes your BAP, which is a uh, dimer containing six zinc ions, two of which are essential for the enzymatic activity. BAP is very stable and not inactivated by the heat and detergent. On the other side, CAP is also a dimer. It requires zinc and magnesium ions for action and is inactivated by heating at 700 for 20 minutes or in the presence of the 10 millimolar EGTA. So alkaline phosphatases are used to remove phosphatases from the DNA as a reporter enzyme. Then comes your reverse transcriptase. These enzymes uses an RNA molecule as a template and synthesizes a DNA strand complementary to the RNA molecule. So these enzymes are used to synthesize the DNA from RNA and these enzymes are present in most of the RNA tumor viruses and retroviruses also called RNA dependent DNA polymerase and reverse transcriptase enzymes after synthesizing the complementary strand at 3 prime end of the DNA strand and this short stretch is called the R loop. Then comes your terminal deoxynucleotide transferase. So this terminal deoxynucleotide transferase is a polymerase which adds nucleotides like 3 prime hydroxyl group clinofragment but does not require any complementary sequence and does not copy any DNA sequence. Uh, further, RNA piece, it specifically cleaves the 5' end of RNA. It is a complex enzyme consisting of small proteins and a 377 nucleotide RNA molecule. And it has been observed that RNA molecule possesses at least a part of enzymatic activity the complex. Hence, it is an example of ribozyme. And last, not the least, uh, within the restriction enzymes, is your clinio fragments one of the important part so e coli dna polymerase one consists of single polypeptide chain so poly one carry out three enzymatic reactions that are performed at three distinct functional domains so two fragments are obtained from the dna polymerase one which is treated with the trypsin in mild conditions and the larger fragment is called clinio fragment here and this fragment is 602 amino acids in the length and the function of clinio fragment is to add nucleotides to the 3 end and 3 5 uh, exonucleus activity. And then clinio fragment adds nucleotide by using complementary strands as reference and it cannot extend the DNA without the presence of the complementary strand. If any nucleotide is added by mistake and the base pair is wrong, then we use 3 5 exonucleus activity present in the clinio fragment. So, in general, the clinio fragment has 5 to 3 prime polymerase and exonucleus activity. So on that note, thank you very much about the restriction enzymes. So so on that note, uh, let us continue with the another part. Let us have a uh, just 2 minutes break here. At 25, we start again. DNA based markers RFLP, AFLP, RAPD, SSRs and MOS. So we will discuss one, one, one by one all these markers that we discuss on the first day if you remember. And I said that all these things we will be dealing in detail in upcoming lectures. So on that day that was just to give you a trailer of the MBBT. But now we are going in detail with each technique, each part in more details. Yeah. So let us have a two minutes break get some water and then we continue.
मेरा मम्मी उठो नहीं 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 ओके ठीक है okay let's start with this topic so basically these molecular markers we will discuss the basic principle first then there are two types of molecular markers one are based on the dna hybridization one are which are based on the pcr amplification yeah then we discuss your rapds aflp and the molecular marker assisted selection first of all the molecular markers what are the molecular markers they are the dna sequence in the group which can be located and identified so as a result of genetic alterations like mutations insertions and deletions the base composition at the particular location of the genome may be different in different plants and these differences collectively called polymorphism can be mapped and identified so plant breeders always prefer to detect the gene as a molecular marker and and the alternative is to have markers which closely associated with the genes and inherited together so the molecular markers are highly reliable advantages in the plant breeding programs uh, the molecular markers they provide two representations of the genetic makeup at the dna level and they are consistent and not affected by the environmental factors So molecular markers can be detected much before development of plants occur and a large number of markers can be generated as per the needs so let us assume that there are two plants of the same species one with disease sensitivity and other with the disease resistance yes so if there is a dna marker that can identify these two alleles then genome can be extracted digested by restriction enzymes and separated by the gel electrophoresis and the dna fragments can be detected by the separation for instance the disease resistant plant may have shorter dna fragment while the disease sensitive plants may have longer dna fragment so molecular markers actually there are of two types they are based on the nucleic acid that is dna hybridization and based on the pcr amplification non pcr based approaches and pcr based approaches so the molecular markers which are having disease sensitive plant and there is a disease resistant plant we extract the dna extract uh, dna from both species and then we digested them uh, with the restriction enzyme and then run over the gel electrophoresis so what we saw the the one with the disease sensitive they gave a shorter dna fragment and then one with the disease resistant plant they gave a longer dna fragment so based on that we can screen these two different plants on based on these molecular markers that we have seen shorter dna fragment and longer dna fragment we can differentiate between the two different species so that's the basic behind your molecular marker is so dna piece can be cloned and allowed to hybridize with genomic dna which can be detected marker based dna hybridization is widely used and the major limitation of this approach is that it requires large quantities of dna and the use of radioactivity so restriction fragment length polymorphism rflp they are very uh, first technology employed for the detection of polymorphism based on the dna sequence differences so rflp is mainly based on the altered restriction enzyme site as a result of mutations and recombination of the genomic dna so in this procedure first what we do is we isolate the genomic dna then digest with restriction enzyme then separate it with electrophoresis then hybridize with the cloned or labeled probes so in this uh, uh, rflp which is a marker based on dna hybridization uh, in the restriction fragment length polymorphism you isolate your genomic dna then digest with restriction endonucleases uh you have lot of dna pieces then you separate by agar gel electrophoresis and then mm -hmm. dna pieces transfer to membrane filter then incubate with the cloned and labeled probes then you have a rflp bands that are mm -hmm. detected at the end mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
So based on the presence of friction sites, DNA fragments of different lengths can be generated by using different structural enzymes. In the figure 53.3 here, what we can see, the two DNA molecules to plant, uh, plant A and B, they are shown here. And the plant and in plant A, mutation has occurred leading to the loss of the restriction site that can be digested by E. coli 1. So in plant A, there used to be a restriction site called E. coli 1 which tend to be removed now. It's not present anymore. Uh, because of that, it, it is not present. Uh, it tend to be uh, mutated and E. coli cannot cut here. In the plant B, E. coli site is present and it can cut there. So this will result that DNA molecules which are digested by the HIN3, uh, but there is no differences in the DNA fragment separation. However, with the E. coli, when we cut them, a DNA molecule is not digested with the uh, plant B DNA molecule is, plant A will be not digested, plant B will be digested. So this give up polymorphic patterns of separation because E. coli site is not present in plant A, so it will not cut, but it's present in here, it will cut. So it gives a polymorphic pattern. So if HIN3, if we put HIN3 in plant A, it will give 200 base pairs, 800 base pairs. In the plant B, if we had HIN3 and E. coli both, so it will give 200, 450 and 350. So three different uh, things are possible. So uh, shown in this gel electrophoresis, when you run with the HIN3 and when you run with the E. coli enzyme. When you run with the HIN3 enzyme, most likely you will see the same pattern. Uh, having 800 base pairs and 200 base pairs in plant A and plant B which shows a mono, monomorphic pattern. Yeah, this is a monomorphic pattern. On the other side, uh, with the polymorphic pattern, if you cut with the E. coli, because there is no site for E. coli, it will be 1000, but it will cut in the plant B, it will have 350 and 650 base pairs. Right? So based on the presence of friction sites, DNA fragment of different lengths can be generated by using different friction enzymes. So in the figure, like if in this figure, we can see, um, Two DNA molecules of so plant A and B were shown and a plant A mutations has occurred leading to the restriction of the digested iron. So here we can see also that plant source A is there, you would have DNA, you had a restriction digestion, then electrophoretic separation, then you do the southern hybridization, then the autoradiography. That's it, that's the main principle behind your DNA hybridizations. Now comes the next part, second type of uh, molecular markers which are based on the PCR amplification that is your polymerase chain reaction which is quite novel technique at the moment and which use amplifications of selected region of DNA. So the main advantage that that in a minute we can have a quantity of DNA which could be amplified and could start the reaction. The result is PCR based markers may be divided into two types. First is locus non-specific markers. Uh, under which examples are random amplified polymorphic DNA that is RAPD then amplified fragment length polymorphism that is AFLP and second is locus specific markers example is simple sequence repeats that is SSRs and single nucleotide polymorphism that is SNP. Uh, so we will discuss each one of them one by one and they both have PCR based is just the difference is the first one is uh, locus non-specific and second one is local specific markers, yeah, SSRs and SNP. So random amplified polymorphic DNA, these markers, they are the molecular markers which are based on the PCR amplification. An outline of RAPD uh, is shown here. So you isolate your genomic DNA, then you denature DNA, the annealing of DNA template with the primers, and then you have complementary stand synthesis, then amplified products by the gel electrophoresis and you identify them. Yeah, so you have a short uh, as we discussed. Uh, it's a PCR, of course, and we anneal them with the primers and we amplify it by the uh, PCR. Then these sh single short oligonucleotide palm primers can be arbitrarily selected and used for amplification of DNA segments of the gene genome, and the amplifier products are separated on the electrophoresis and could be identified. So some ap applications of these RAPDs in plants, 
So RAPD is highly used in the distinguish between variety of DNA sequences. Yeah. And this produced 296 markers and this could be scored. Uh, further, here we can see that for example, DNA from plant allows the amplification of sequences A, C and D but not B. So you have uh, various plant varieties A, B, C, D. Yeah. And then when you run over the gel, only B will not show differences in the gel. Uh, various fragments only A, C and D are showing these differences. So this indicates that plant 1 primer sites uh, for the primer use not found in the sequence B. So whatever the sequence that we were using in plant A, it is not present in the plant B. Similarly, DNA sequence alternation is one of the primary binding site and has prevent from being the amplified when DNA fragment uh, from DNA plant is used. Uh, so it does not show anything in that part. And RAPD markers have been used to identify several disease resistance genes in plants. So RP94 gene which is responsible for resistance to stem rust that is Puccinia graminis in barley. And RAPD markers they identify to link to the gene. Similarly, RAPD markers link to heat smut resistance also. Now another one on uh, the PCR based markers. Let us discuss this one amplified fragment length polymorphism that is AFLP. So basically AFLP if we have discussed RFLP and RAPD and AFLP is a combination of both RFLP and RAPD. So AFLP is based on the principle of generation of DNA fragments using restriction enzymes and oligonucleotide adapters and their amplifications by PCR. Thus this technique combines the usefulness of restriction digestions and PCR. So DNA of the genome is, is extracted and it is subject to restriction digestion by two enzymes. So PCR is now performed for the pre-selection of fragment of DNA and three nucleotide sequences are amplified and autoradiography uh, can be performed for the detection of DNA fragments and use of labeled primers and fluorescently labeled fragments which is AFLP. So here we can see uh, our two sequences of DNA, DNA molecule ACC, ACTTA, GAC and so on. And then you had restriction enzymes which cut left side 6 cutter and right side 4 cutter MSC1 and E. coli 1. So it is cut from this part A yeah, this one and this one cut from this part CTTG 3 prime end, 3 prime end, 5 prime end and 5 prime end. Then you ligation with the linker, you ligate with the linker and then you, what you will see that um, they will start correspondingly growing the part with the help of PCR and so like CTTG will produce GTTA and it would cut the other part from the top and it will start growing from the bottom. So T, it will have the corresponding T is A, then C, then here is C, A, T and so on. So this is a diagrammatic representation showing the AFLP. So the lower case letters that we are seeing here represent the sequence found within the amplified region and the colored lines indicate the linkers here. So they are linkers also. These are the linkers, this purple colors and the small letters that we are seeing here, they represent the sequence that are found in the PCR. So you have, a, you have to isolate your plant DNA, your restric, uh, restriction fragment have to be restrict your fragments, then you ligate with adapters, then add non-specific primers and perform PCR, then you do the electrophoresis. So amplified fragment length polymorphism that is AFLP. So AFLP is primarily used in the genetic mapping, several economic important cereal crops such as rice, barley and wheat have been mapped by AFLP. So AFLP markers which are produced by different combinations of friction enzymes. In barley, AFLP markers are located on the long and short arm of all seven chromosomes. So these AFLP markers exhibit strong relation between the number of markers per chromosome and length of chromosome. So like level of polymorphism could be detected in AFLP can range from 12.2% to 29%. 
and the merits are they could be used to screen larger number of polymorphism so they have uh, many advantages as compared to the previous methods you can get to know about the qualitative traits in barley and rice uh, we can screen pools of plasmid DNA from several clones yeah could be used in many parts of research so it has uh, numerous uh, applications as compared to the previous markers that we have discussed that is your RAPD and RFLP so it's one of the uh, majorly used technique in the case of molecular markers I hope you are all there again students okay so now we have discussed the major markers that are used in the plant breeding so this is what we are talking is not more into the you know uh, plant based or uh, sorry animal based this is more plant based actually today now comes your sequence tag sites STS so they are the one which represent unique simply copy segments of genomes and whose DNA sequences are known to be uh, amplified by using the PCRs so they are the polymorphism of simple nucleotide repeats example G A G T C A and so on so when the STS loci contain simple sequence length polymorphism that is SSL uh, P's they are highly valuable as molecular markers then comes your microsatellites they are the tandemly repeated multi copies of mono di tri and tetra nucleotide motifs in some instances the flanking flanking sequence of repeated sequences may be unique and could be detected then comes your sequence characterized amplified regions that is scars they are the modified form of STS markers and they are developed by the PCR markers that made for the ends of RAPD fragment and STS converted RAPD markers are sometimes referred to as scars and they are useful for rapid development of STS markers the sequence characterized amplified region scars they are the modified form of STS markers they are developed by PCR primer that are made end of the RAPD fragments then this is the last one uh, under these molecular markers that is a molecular marker assisted selection so they are the selection of desired, desired traits and improvement of crops that has been part of the conventional breeding program so this is predominantly based on the identification of your phenotypes it is now uh, an accepted fact that phenotypes do not primarily represent the genotype many times the environment may mark the genotype here so they are based on the identification of DNA markers that link and represent the plant trait so these traits include resistance to pathogens, insects, tolerance to abiotic stress and various other qualitative and quantitative traits an advantage with the molecular marker is that the plant breeder can select suitable marker for a desired trait which can be detected well in the advance the following are the major requirement for the molecular uh, mark selections in plant breeding uh, the marker should closely link with the desired trait the marker screening method must efficiently reproducible and easy to carry out and the analysis uh, should be economical in these cases then molecular breeding um, so this is more like better uh, technique than the normal plant breeding technique that is being used so you can have frequently used this technique for breeding methods that are coupled with the genetic engineering techniques so improved agriculture to meet the food demands of the world is high priority area and have certainly helped to improve grain yield and cereal production and the development of dwarf and semi dwarf varieties of rice and wheat have been responsible for the green revolution yeah so many developments on the agriculture front are expected in the coming years as a result of molecular breeding comes linkage analysis these are the analysis deals with the studies to correlate the link between the molecular markers and desired traits so if you are looking for you know as a drought tolerance trait salt tolerant uh, trait uh, high yield trait uh, pesti, uh, some pest resistance trait some hard resistance trait right so there are many traits that you are looking for so in that case the linkage analysis play a big role and this is also important quantitative trait loci QTLs so there are many characteristics these are being used actually in Reliance company uh, in uh, Ahmedabad in Gujarat yeah so they are they are using these QTLs for production of large amount of plants 
so they have many characteristics which should be controlled by several genes in complex manner for example growth habit yield adaptability to environment and disease resistance so they are referred to as quantitative trait yeah their location on the chromosomes uh, genes are regarded as the quantitative trait loci for example your golden rice which was enriched with the pro vitamin a involves insertion of three genes took about seven years to do so so that's it from the molecular markers perspective now mainly the last topic is left of yours that is your dna fingerprinting so to understand the dna fingerprinting uh, we have to have clear idea first of all about uh, dna markers and restriction enzyme and combination of these two actually will be able to us understand the dna fingerprinting so that's why first i started with the restriction enzyme today then we finish this part of dna molecular markers now the third section that we're going to start is now your uh, dna fingerprinting which is your combination of restriction enzymes and dna molecular markers so whosoever want to be work in the forensic science or in forensic world uh, to find out the culprit to find out the parents or to find out the genome that to whom does it belong so in that case your dna fingerprinting works out so why we use dna fingerprinting it's a way of telling individual that it's belong to the same species or if they are a bit different uh, the sequences are variable and can therefore be used for identifying the characteristics so dna fingerprinting has advantage over the source of evidence like fingerprint blood type hair you know all these things they give us highly accurate results and can be gathered from the trace crime scene evidence so how do you take dna fingerprint so one way is restriction fragment length polymorphism so that we have just discussed rflp and restriction enzymes are molecules that cut dna into pieces and each enzymes cut at specific dna sequence so all human beings we have roughly uh, the same dna sequence but there are some small number of changes in the differences and these differences can be seen by the restriction enzymes so here we have a bam h1 yeah which will come and will cut the dna sequence from its uh, specific part this like pac man then after cutting it's give you sticky ends so let's say you have a individual one Uh, it has a chance to cut from the four part and giving you a five fragments and individual two it can only cut from three parts giving you four different fragments not five like in the individual one so in this case we can differentiate between individual one and individual two whether they belong to crime scene or not and we can confirm these things so in summary essentially once the uh, dna has been cut by the enzyme we will have a dna fragments of various sizes and each individual bending pattern should be different because the restriction enzymes will cut each person dna at different points so fragment of different sizes will travel different distances along a gel when electric current is passed through it so here we can see different bending patterns for different individuals individual 1 individual 2 3 4 5 6 and so on all are giving different results so how we can use this, this uh, dna fingerprinting and for the forensic analysis um so forensic science can be defined as the intersection of your law and science so first photography of your fingerprint in 1985 dna fingerprint was taken in so dna fingerprinting show unique patterns from one person to the next usually paternity dispute that that kid belong to that parent or that parent or for the forensic evidence So first, we take the specimen. Yeah, is it a leaked envelope, dirty laundry, cigarette butt, anything? And special precautions in handling the specimens, like gloves, disposable instruments. Avoid talking, sneezing. Avoid touching sample with your skin. Air dry the evidence before packaging so mold does not grow. And enemies of evidence are sunlight, high temperatures, bacteria, and moisture. An ideal sample is one ml of fresh whole blood, and so on. so rflp the restriction fragment length polymorphism the nucleotide sequence variation in region of dna that generates fragment length differences according to the presence of or absence of a restriction enzyme uh, recognition sites 
so you have individual one you have individual two right so you can uh, make a comparison between them uh, so individual one is cutting mainly giving you three fragments and individual two is giving you two fragments so then you run them over the gel electro forces so it gives you three fragments here two fragments here so you can differentiate between the two people here very nicely so molecular technique where dna is transferred onto the membrane with the help of a gross gel and then we hybridize with the probe so here southern blotting technique is being used this we have done the southern blot not repeat that then there is a vntrs that is variable num uh, number tandem repeats that is a vntrs which sequences are separated multiple times and number of repeats varies from person to person so in the first one there are five repeats in the second there are two repeats so they are vntrs usually occurs in introns and can be amplified by PCRs and run on the agros gels to identify produce unique D DNA fragments. So here the five fragments shows like this and two fragments shows like this. So polymerase chain reaction uh, is also used in these DNA fragments to amplify your specific DNA fragments if you have a less amount. So we will not repeat this PCR, this we have done all these 94 annealing denaturation 30 times polymers pcr what are the applications of dna fingerprinting it helps to diagnose diseases yeah veterinary testing in forensic uh, finding the crime scene yeah dna fingerprinting So let's uh, do a really quick animation here, one quick DNA fingerprinting. So there's a Nova company on the November 1st, approximately at 8.15. Jimmy Sweet entered his bedroom, walked over the desk and he saw that this everything was disorganized. And he closely looked over that as he saw that this airtight package seal uh, was opened up. And his, his eyes was very, was very much scared about that. And it was Jimmy Lollipop was opened up, the most valued possession. Um, that is your Nova lollipop and then he he saw that someone had licked away that was not the normal so the Jimmy has seven sisters candy cookie sugar lolly honey brandy Kamala so they are all notorious candy lover and maybe one of them had done that and they are not confessing it anymore so what we will do the licked candy will be sent to the lab and they will check who out of these innocent girls did this crime so first thing first you add section enzymes to DNA samples yeah you take your section enzyme this is a DNA sample and then uh, you add this egg rose gel into the lab counter this egg rose gel into this after this put DNA into the tray Turn on the power button, your gel will run and add the nylon membrane, you transfer it over the nylon membrane, your gel, uh, proteins, they got transferred, now you add probes that specifically that you are looking for, then you put x-ray film over the top to transfer it to see them under the developer, then develop into the developer this fragment and now choose the culprit. So here we can see uh, the saliva that we see after the DNA fingerprinting, the gel patterns look like that. And these are the normal DNA fingerprinting of all the suspects look like. So we will try to match with them. So this one is not matching or is it matching? No, it's not matching. This one is it matching? No. This one is it matching? No. This one is it matching? No. This one? No. Is this one? Is it? Yeah, this one I guess or yeah honey honey is the culprit so she is the one so we have uh, got our honey is the culprit of the crime thanks to Nova lab for the case to be solved nicely so we can see yeah, Molly, uh, uh, not at the moment. So I will try to do 
uh, please keep in uh, everyone students who ever joined in here please be in the group i will start some classes maybe in future if i got a chance to work in the lab i will i will start doing all these practicals uh, make a video with the help of maybe putting one g g gopro camera over my turban and start doing these experiments and we can have a live session about it yeah with my with my mic on my shirt and then i'm teaching you all techniques one by one each day uh, while doing the experiments but in this session these techniques will be done in this way because i'm doing this from the last one year i think you are my last batch today here and uh, but i really want that i could also teach you all these techniques in practical way but uh, to be honest my 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 inner heart says that you should do all these techniques in one of the biggest uh, labs in the world and do under the uh, famous professors maybe and make it uh, make these things uh, you know make yourself proud i would say okay i'm teaching you these at the at the level of uh, virtual level but you do them by your own hand in upcoming time get a good position clear your gate exam clear your csir clear your jrf positions yeah uh, clear for foreign positions uh clear for some scholarships international scholarships uh there are many 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 opportunities for each one of you available at the moment since the covid has opened uh everything has opened everything is again back is just you need to grab the opportunity each one of you yeah so from glonology respective uh, is pretty much used that that's it uh the dna finger printing so i will share all these three different parts so students we see us then at 9 pm i think uh, we are good on time it was good that we made it to one hour this class so then in the evening we will do more interesting topics more interesting things then see you then take care bye bye ciao it will be very much interesting believe me the today's 9 pm class yeah online lab uh, there there is a online lab available mm -hmm. what is that lab call it's not working in my computer maybe because of mac problem but you can try if it is working this is the dna extraction they were very very nice actually very nice workshops but they are not working anymore digital electrophoresis let me know if they are working in my case they are not working i have some problem with the flash yeah uh, molly chakravarti just try them it will be nice to check them so see you then take care bye bye see you at 9